How's that look? Good. Good. Right in the middle. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. I am uh, at my program up there. It's the first time I've done this by Zoom, by the way. Uh, well, actually, the second time because I did it as a practice with uh, John last week. Uh, my title, as you can see, is The Birds and the Bees, Where Rose Babies Come From. Uh, mm -hmm. I was specifically asked uh, for a program on hybridizing, which I have given this one in the past, and so I updated it to uh, add some things to it and take some things out of it that I no longer believe, which is what my custom is with programs. Uh, we're talking about making a new rose, and it requires a little faith. Uh, the, to many people, it's somewhat a mysterious uh, process of uh, bringing life, rose life into existence. Uh, my experience is what I am about to tell you about, uh, which is uh, how I did it. Here's uh, how Victor Frankenstein did it. And so <laughs> this is how I did it as an amateur hybridizer, um, <clears throat> Years ago, I wrote an article uh, that appeared in the 2000 American Rose Annual on Amateur Hybridizers, and I was originally reluctant to use that term amateur uh, until I spoke to Paul Jarabak, who reminded me that the word amateur comes from the Latin word amos, which is to love, and it's uh, somebody who does something simply for the love of it, and that's uh, basically what I have done with hybridizing. Uh, it is an additional thing. There's nothing about roses that doesn't interest me. And so I decided I wanted to see if I could do it myself, make a rose. And the intention here was not to produce some kind of a, you know, a, a new career because uh, I have a day job, which I continue to have. But basically, this is how I did it. And it's also how you can do it, which is uh, really what this program is about as well. Uh, instead of using how I did it, I use this book. This is Rose Hybridizing for Beginners, which is published by the Rose Hybridizers Association. It was then for sale for $5. It is for sale today for $5 through the Rose Hybridizers Association. It has everything that you need to know in order to be able to hybridize roses. I bought this book. I read it. I read it a second time. And this is essentially my Bible that I use for how to hybridize. The Rose Hybridizers Association, as you can see, has a website at rosehybridizers.org. Uh, you can sign on there. Uh, everyone is welcome to join it. Uh, you can order the book I just showed you. This is a second book they put out that I also contributed several chapters to called Rose Hybridizing, The Next Step, which goes into a little more detail, including the commercialization of roses. So if you want to interested in becoming an amateur hybridizer or just how amateurs do it, uh, both of these books are well worth getting. We're going to start with the concept of propagation or reproduction, uh, asexual reproduction. Actually, this photograph here uh, depicts both uh, sexual and asexual reproduction. The adult in this photograph is the famous sheep, uh, Bonnie. Bonnie was the first animal that was ever cloned. And it was a clone that basically started with cells and uh, produced Bonnie. And Bonnie was an exact duplicate or clone of, uh, I don't recall what Bonnie's, uh, what the name was of the, uh, the animal she was cloned from, but that's Bonnie. Uh, actually, that's, and take, take that back, that's Dolly. Dolly is the one that's the clone. Bonnie is the little one here, that's her offspring. So this is a picture of uh, Dolly the clone and Dolly, Bonnie the offspring, uh, which represents sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction, when you're talking about roses, roses have the ability to regenerate a new rose system, unite with another plant by grafting. So it's possible to produce an entire population of rose plants from a single plant, which is exactly what happens when roses are introduced and you are essentially getting a clone. You are getting a clone. Whenever you buy a rose, uh, name rose, uh, you're getting a clone of the uh, rose. It's somewhat interesting to think about when you look at some of the old garden roses that's been around since the 15th century and earlier, and it is a clone. I mean, uh, so 
the, it's, it's a clone of cells that existed at, you know, five, 600 years ago. That always fascinates me just to think about it. But basically this is a clone. And this is, uh, you know, so if you're taking cuttings or if there's grafting, uh, you're, not, you're creating a new plant, but you're not creating a new rose. How do you create a new rose? Well, that has to do with sexual propagation. Sexual propagation, the birds and the bees. Now, we're gonna talk about making a new rose here. Here we are. You see my little cartoon here of the cat uh, getting home with its kittens. Uh, what you have when you cross roses, uh, this is um, an important point to understand, something that actually puzzled me uh, earlier in my career as a rosarian uh, when I got interested in the parents of various roses and I would find roses that had the same parents. And yet they were entirely different roses. And that puzzled me. How could they uh, have entirely different roses? And the answer is that we're talking about biology. We're not talking about chemistry. If you're talking chemistry and you mix two H's and an O, you always get water. You mix sodium and chloride, and you always get salt. In biology, you mix a mother and a father, and you get children. You get kittens if you're a cat. And Ooh. with roses, you get kittens, you get roses and every single one of them is going to be different. There are family characteristics that are carried through that you will see with your children or other people's children. You know, uh, that's always kind of a thing where you got a baby and you'll say, oh, it's got Uncle Fred's nose and Uncle Aunt, uh, Aunt uh, Amy's uh, eyebrows or whatever. Uh, yeah, there are family characteristics, but every one of them is new. Now the rose, from a sexual standpoint, has both sexual parts. It is both a male and a female. And the female parts are in the very center of the rose and are called collectively the pistil. And at the top of the pistil is a little knob-like structure called the stigma, which is this thing right there. That's the stigma. And that's uh, the place where the, as I will show you, uh, the pollen is received and so that a rose can reproduce. The male parts are called the stamens. That's the collective term for the male parts. They form a ring around the pistil. That's all this stuff here. And, and at the top of each stamen is an anther that produces pollen. Anther produces pollen as you can. There is an anther and the anther has what's called a filament. That's this thing that connects it to it. And right at the top is the anther that produces pollen. And this is what the pollen looks like. <laughs> and no doubt, if you've been raising roses for any period of time, you will have seen the pollen on roses. Here's a cross section of the pistil. This is the stigma again, the part at the top. This is where the pollen lands. I go and wiggle back and forth and this is causing the uh, thing. Then you have what's called the style so that the pollen travels down the style and it travels into an ovary, familiar term in human reproduction, but also the term in plant reproduction and in rose reproduction. And that is where the seeds of the rose develop. So you go about collecting pollen. How do you collect pollen? Well, you can get yourself a bee and a bee does that, bee runs around and collects pollen. Here's a bee collecting pollen. And if you look at a bee very closely, he's got these little bags. He's got little pollen sacks and he, little traveling bags that the bee collects the pollen on and he can take them back to the, uh, to the hive. But you don't have a bee that can go to work for you, but so you're gonna have to manually collect your pollen. And the way that you manually collect the pollen is you move all the petals to expose the stamens the stamens should be plump and not yet have released their pollen. So if you were looking at a rose and you wanted to collect the pollen, uh, ideally it's one that's just kind of open like that. It's already beginning to go toward fully open, but not quite too fully open. That's the point in time in which the pollen will be there. Then you can collect it and you are able to collect the pollen. The way you collect the pollen is with your fingers or tweezers or scissors, you gently remove the stamens from the bloom. Cuticle scissors work perfectly good for this. This is what I use. And you clip them off. <laughs> you 
It's set the pollen aside in the house on a piece of paper. Well, that's what uh, Judy does. I, I don't do that. I put it in a small, actually what I get, and I probably should have got a picture of these. Uh, uh, I go to the, uh, the store where you get uh, supplies for artists and you get little, little cups like that that uh, are used apparently for paint. And uh, I use these pollen cups, and that's uh, and then I can label the top of the column, and I put the uh, put them in these little jars. You put them in a warm spot overnight, about seventy-five degrees or so, and let it sit. Mm -hmm. Now you have the other process, which is called emasculation, and we have picked the mother, and we generally refer to the seed parent. The, uh, as the mother, and you've selected a mother, and we'll come back to that at a point and explain mm -hmm. how you go about selecting what the mothers would be. And you generally remove the stamens from the mother bloom, and you leave the mother bloom attached to the plant, which is kind of obvious, but uh, I mentioned that. You obviously don't clip it off. It's attached to the plant. And what my practice is, is to actually remove all but one petal uh, and so I've got that petal there so I can find uh, that uh, prepared mother uh, the next day. Because what happens is that when you do this, the stigma here goes and gets kind of a sticky little substance to it overnight. And it seems to requ it requires it overnight to do that. You can also remove the stamens, by the way, with your tweezers. Some people do that. I use the little clippers. And here's where I point out that you leave one or two petals to find it the next day. So now you're going to go for pollination. Pollination you will do the next day as a general proposition, uh, at least with respect to the mother plants. The pollen itself stays active for some period of time. And I'm not sure how long you can keep it, but uh, it's, uh, you, it's available for, for days and days and days afterwards. So if you go about pollination, you can get your bee friend to work for you again, but he's probably not going to do that. Here's another bee at work. Manually, what you do is you take your finger or use a small brush. What I do is I take the little plastic cups that I have put the pollen in and I shake it. And when I shake it, it releases the pollen and it releases the pollen on the side of the cup. And then I can stir the cup with my finger. And I take my finger and I stick it right on that stigma and I shove it in there and I push it. And that's sex with the rose, is to go and put the pollen right there and into the stigma of the prepared female. Here I am uh, with an example, uh, Judy Singer's good friend of mine in Tucson, Arizona, is an amateur hybridizer, has a lot of better pictures than I did. And here is one of using the finger of putting the pollen right there on the stigma. Then you need to put a label. Judy does something uh, which I don't agree with and she just, she doesn't bother to label the, the mother. And the reason she doesn't label the mother is because you already know what the mother is, the plant sitting there and you know, your plant probably has a label on it saying what it is. So she labels what the cross is. So whatever it is she had there is by Miami Moon. Well, what I do is I put both names on there because I know when I harvest the hips, I'm going to cut it off. And so it's no longer associated there with the plant itself. And it's easy to lose track of your crosses. If your pollination is successful, the hip will start to swell the next three to four weeks. And the seeds are fattening up inside. This is what a hip developing looks like. And it continues to go and it continues to ripen. Here are hips ripen. How long does it take to ripen? About 150 days, about five months. And this gets into the question of the timing of this, because the timing of this depends upon a number of factors. The main factor being whether you're doing this in a greenhouse or you're doing this out of doors. I don't have a greenhouse. I've long wanted a greenhouse. I have no place to put a greenhouse. And so all of my hybridizing has been done out of doors, which I can do successfully in California because our out of doors is not quite as you know, hard as your out of doors is in New York. Um, when do you make the crosses? Typically in the springtime. Uh, the professionals do it in the fields, usually in April and May. Uh, for years, my practice has been to do it in, in June. 
usually in the middle of June. And the reason for that is because normally uh, in years when we have rose shows, I'm showing roses until the beginning of June, through June, often at the fair. And so when the rose shows stop in the spring, I would then go and make my crosses. That gives me the five months or so that's necessary in order for them to ripen. And I would harvest them in November, which is after our fall rose shows. And so that timing has always worked well for me. My suspicion is that uh, if you were to do it in New York, you probably want to do it in June, uh, which is springtime, and uh, be able to harvest them uh, in late October, early November when the seeds are ripe. How do you tell when the seeds are ripe? And the answer is they'll just generally fall off by themselves. Uh, if you go and you flick them with your finger like that, they'll just pop right off of there and that shows that they're ripe and ready to go. Uh, or if they just you know break off very easily. If you have to break them off or cut them off, they're not quite ripe yet. And, and I do not recommend that you do that. Here's what's going on inside the ripening hip. As you can see, as you've got these Oh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Akeens, uh, each one bears a seed. Here's a seed. And there is the calyx tube. And this is what's going to be going on inside of your hips. And you'll notice that uh, this has been cut right in half. Uh, and here's one another that's been cut right in half that shows seeds inside. How many seeds you're going to have inside? And the answer is that varies. It varies from anywhere between one and 40. <laughs> and uh, it seems to have to do with how many pollen granules actually got down through the styles. It has to do with the variety. It has to do with a number of things. They are what they are. I can tell you that these seeds are extremely hard. And so it is real easy. All you do is take your pruning shears and cut the tip right in half. You don't have to worry about cutting the seeds in half because that won't happen. You can cut your... <laughs> uh, your hip right in half and expose the seeds. Sometimes the seeds even appear on the outer side. Here's a picture that Weeks has, and I've seen this happen any number of times as well. So the time comes to collect up all your hips. Here's where the birds and the bees come in. You put the birds through business and they will go and collect hips. And that's kind of nature's way. You know, nature's way is that uh, the birds would collect the uh, hips and the birds would eat the hips. And then the birds would, the uh, seeds would pass through the birds along with a little bit of fertilizer and wind up in the ground. You know, I can tell you an interesting side story on this. Uh, I read an article one time, there was a plant that was in Madagascar. There was a tree, it was very, very common in Madagascar, but uh, there had been no new ones in a long time. And they could never get the seeds of the tree to, to uh, germinate. Uh, and uh, after time, you know, this, these trees were dying off and they couldn't figure out how to reproduce the trees. And they did a little bit of study and determined that they used to have some kind of a bird there that uh, they no longer had. So they, uh, they brought in turkeys and they had the turkeys eat the seeds and the turkeys then digested the seeds, which removed the covering that's on the seeds, every seed of a flowering plant has some kind of protective coating or fiber to it that prevents it from germinating. And what happened is that uh, the turkeys would break down that uh, uh, fibrous coating of the seed and lo and behold, the seeds germinated and they had the trees again. Here is a collection of seeds. This is Weeks Roses uh, from their website. And this, uh, I mean, that's pretty much the way I do it as well. You see those little tags. I like the little orange ones. I get the orange tags from the stationery store and I mark each of the tags and then you can collect up your seeds, uh, your, your hips. And you cut the seeds, the hips open and out come all these little seeds. Uh, I take a dental tool that I found on a swamp meet years ago. And I use it to scrape off this fibrous material. You can see this fibrous material right here. This fibrous material is all on the seeds and it is there to uh, inhibit germination. And by removing it, you can encourage and increase your germination. Here's 
Rose's natural way of going about it, and go back to my bird example, is that the bird would eat the hips and the hips would deposit it and then there would be winter. And this is something that's not particularly well known to us here in California, at least what we call winter is nothing at all like what you call winter. And uh, roses need winter. And so you need to make some winter. And after cleaning the seeds need a long cold nap in the refrigerator so they think it's winter, and so you make little beds for your seeds using quilted paper towels. You can cut a towel in half or a third. Here is how Judy does it, which is exactly how I do it as well, by creating beds for my, my seeds. And she puts them in the bottom of the refrigerator or in the vegetable bin. This is called stratification. Uh, the vegetable bin is there because you were, you were not trying to freeze them. The interesting story in Herb Swim's book where they accidentally froze a whole uh, generation of seeds one time. He still had a number of pretty good roses to propagate out of them, but uh, it inhibits them to, to freeze the seeds. You don't want to freeze them, but you want to stratify them, give them winter, and they need winter for about eight weeks. So they sit there in winter, and then it becomes time to plant. You prepare a planting pot or tray with a seed starting mix. Your winter can go longer than eight weeks, by the way. And again, if you're going to be doing this out of doors, uh, you know, you can wait to your springtime in order to plant. You prepare a planting uh, pot or a tray with a seed starting mix that is moistened with water. You make a small indentation in the soil, place the seed in the indentation. You barely cover the seed with soil. One year, uh, oh, I had read, I was trying to improve germination, and I can tell you right now, germination is a real hit or miss thing. On average, you, know, you get germination of maybe 30%. 70% of your seeds will not germinate. Uh, it varies widely. I mean, there are certain plants, uh, you know, they don't germinate at all. I mean, it, they, uh, there's a sterility factor that comes in and you don't get germination. In others, uh, you get a much higher percentage of germination. Uh, one year trying to improve germination, I had read somewhere that if I covered the bed with a small layer of sand, that that would somehow uh, improve uh, the drainage uh, for uh, germination. And I did that, and what that did is it prevented the seeds from coming up. Uh, so I actually had much poorer germination. So that's uh, when I put the seed in the indentation, I barely cover the seed with soil. And what happens is the seed will germinate. Here is a seed germinating. You can see it coming out of there. So you then put your pot in a bright spot. You know, you can put it in your basement. You can put it in a greenhouse. Uh, Joe Winchell, the great hybridizer, he started his career hybridizing in Michigan. He did it in the basement. And he set up lights uh, for the basement and uh, used that as his uh, area for raising seedlings. Uh, or you can put them outside in a protected area if in fact you don't have, you know, the, the risk of freezing has passed. You keep the soil damp, but not wet, damp. And in time, what will happen is something will come up that looks just like that. That's a plant. And what you will have is what here, here you see a bunch of them. This is uh, a bed here. You see the seedlings that are popping up here, here, here. You have what I call mouse ears, and botanically, they're known as cotyledons. Cotyledon is the primary rudimentary leaf of the embryo of a seed plant, and that's exactly what it looks like. Uh, this is Jim Sproul's method, by the way. Uh, he uses perlite on top of his uh, seed beds. That's not snow, that's perlite. Uh, and he uses that because it proves drainage, but still it doesn't provide too much weight and the uh, seeds will pop up through it. Then in time, you will get what we call a true leaf. This is a true leaf. This is a very first true leaf, and that's what it looks like. And in about six to eight weeks, you will get a small flower bud. that looks just like that. And then it will bloom. Nine times out of 10, it'll be a single. It'll look just like that. Uh, just or maybe maybe eight times that depends on where your crosses are, but you'll get a bloom and you'll start seeing a bloom. 
And this is where decisions then start having to be made. You know, if you're a professional hybridizer, you know, if you're David Austin Roses and you've got 100,000 seedlings to evaluate, they evaluate. I can remember one time uh, I got a call from Tom Carruth and he was heading up to Wasco. He says, hey, I'm going up to Wasco tomorrow to kill babies. You want to come along with me? Uh, you know, he basically goes up there and, and they, they make judgments right now. You can take a look at that and say, is that something worth keeping? And, uh, you know, when you've got 100,000 to pick from, uh, you, you're looking for something novel, something unique. One of the advantages we, have, uh, non, as we as amateurs have is we don't have to do that. We can wait and see what this is. That's what I do. I, you know, I mean, I, if I got this, I, I'd hang on to it and, and wait till it develops. Because I can tell you one thing. The one thing you can tell when you first look at a seedling is you can get some idea of its color. And the color is usually pretty accurate. And, you know, you get some idea of its vigor, a little bit about its foliage, but the number of petals, for example, the seedling like that, I can tell you that, uh, you know, there might, the next bloom might have uh, twice as many, and, and thereafter, uh, they can add more petals to it. So you don't know immediately, and you don't have to make judgments immediately, and, and it's kind of fun to just keep them. I can tell you one thing that happens if you get into this uh, business of hybridizing is that you will wind up with more plants than you know what to do with always and you know it's just you know they, it will start overrunning everything that you've got you got all these plants that you gave me sooner or later you're going to have to start making decisions and getting rid of some but for now let's assume that we'll take a look at that and then maybe if you're really lucky you'll get something like that <laughs> that's fairly fairly old that's the oldest picture i have of buttercream that I hybridized, and I don't recall exactly how old that bloom was, but that's how it that, that <coughs> looking like that very, very early. I knew that I had something almost immediately when I looked at that. I looked back at my notes of this rose, and uh, and I had put a five star on it immediately as being something that I wanted to follow. So let me explain, now that I've shown you the process of going through it, uh, let's be more detailed. I'm going to give you some explanation of how I went about uh, selecting and what I got out of it so that you can draw some knowledge out of that, that you could make your own path. And that's what you really need to do. Every, every hybridizer, you, know, you, you have to ask yourself, you know, why am I doing this? What, 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 what's your objective? What are you trying to accomplish? Right. What, what, what would your baby look like? And uh, so here I am, uh, actually, I'm just cleaning a leaf over there. And here I am at age eight with a uh, baby lizard in my hand. Uh, I started my breeding program. Actually, I started a little before this particular one, but I, I had this table that I built and I can't even recall why I built this table. But as you can see, it's just a table, a wooden table and it's got uh, shade cloth over the top. And, and this is uh, in my second house, third house in Pasadena. Uh, this, is where, this is where buttercream was born. Uh, this is where many of the roses that I first produced were born and were on this. Um, so you can see here, well, you see what you can see here is a bunch of one gallon containers. This is, this is you see all the one gallon containers here and there. And this is what happens in time when you set up a breeding program is you wind up with roses coming out of your ears. First thing I decided to do is I thought, well, okay, uh, I've just been through this whole process. I read about it and it seems to me that making all the effort to make a cross and uh, uh, stratify and plant and so on. The first thing I got to do is figure out whether or not I can make plants grow from seed. And so what I decided to do was simply to harvest the hips of some roses that produced hips on their own, that I would be interested to see what the seeds look like. And then back to the point about the seeds, you harvest the hips, go out there in your garden if you've got hips now and harvest them and raise those seeds and every one of those, unless you have a species rose, and pretty much the definition of a species rose is that it grows true from seed is you will get something different. So I, I gather some hips from Roller Coaster, which is a miniature rose of Sam McGreedy. And you see this striped rose. I'm very much taken by striped rose. You see this red, see that red there? 
So I raised a number of seedlings of roller coaster and I got that. Now it's the very first rose that I produced and I named it Margie, I named it after my mother. My mother always wore bright red lipstick. She loved the color red and it just seemed to be perfectly appropriate to call the first rose that I came up with Margie, which I introduced back in 1999. And you can see the red from roller coaster and I still have about a, you know, a dozen plants of Margie. She, uh, I actually had, I, when I registered this rose, I took this, this picture here, uh, had it framed and she had it on her wall for years before she passed away. I also had this Noisette uh, Nasturana that I was growing that had hips on it. I just went out into the garden and, and I harvested some hips off a bunch of roses. I didn't really keep that close to track of which ones I had, but I know I picked up Nasturana, which is a Noisette and, and I raised a seedling from it which is called Elizabeth Navarro. It's named after the daughter of a former law partner of mine, a uh, delightful young girl. She was like 10 years old at the time, or eight. And it never grew very big, uh, you know, even though it was the seedling of a, a uh, nest of a uh, noisette. Noisettes are not supposed to grow. I mean, I generally grow very, very big. This one never got big at all. And for years and years and years, I didn't know what to register this as. And I finally read an article that Ralph Moore had written, in which he said that if a rose, you know, uh, the, the polyanthic characteristics are in all roses, and that if it grows like a polyantha and looks like a polyantha, then it's a polyantha. It's kind of like if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. So this became a polyantha that I introduced. Having satisfied myself that I could raise roses from hips and seeds, I decided to make my own crosses. And I made a lot of crosses. And so what I'm gonna do here is describe those that are successful. Most of the crosses I made were unsuccessful. However, the percentages that you read about, uh, you know, with the hybridizers, David Austin will tell you, they'll take 100,000 ceilings and introduce 11. Uh, actually, they they had a lot more good ones than that, uh, and you will get a lot. You, there's not that. There's not the odds are not that bad. The odds are actually pretty good in your favor, uh, but still, the great bulk of the roses, 90, 95 percent that you produce, uh, will you know they don't germinate, and if they do germinate, you know, there's nothing novel about them, nothing interesting about them, and you'll end up getting rid of them, but. Uh, from time to time, you'll get things that are interesting and then you decide to keep those. So anyway, I made this cross. I took roller coaster again. And the thing I knew about roller coaster is that it sets hips. And the first thing you have to do, if you're going to figure out what your parents are going to be, you need as a mother plant, a rose that will set hips. And most modern roses do not set hips. And so the very first thing you would do is identify a mother and I could identify the mother. And how did I know that this would be a mother is because I already harvested hips from it. And I'd already brought those hips uh, and germinated uh, seeds from those hips. And so I knew that I had a mother that would work. And so I crossed it. And the reason I made this cross is simply because roller coaster was in a pot sitting on a tree stump and right behind it on a chain link fence was the climber Altissimo. So one day I said, well, I'll just cross Altissimo on the roller coaster and see what I get. And I did. What's interesting about this is that Tom Carruth made that very same cross I discovered later. And this is what, this is what Tom got. That's the parents of 4th of July, the great climber. And I thought that was very interesting that I, uh, I learned what Tom had got because this is what I got. I got this little bitty miniature <laughs> that I named after my mother-in-law who was then my mother-in-law. She's later passed away and is now the mother of my ex-wife. And so she's no longer my mother-in-law. In fact, this rose doesn't exist anymore because the last one I had uh, died. I think Baldo still may have the last one on the planet, but this is what I got out of it. I got a very tiny miniature, whereas Tom Carruth got a very vigorous climber. 
I mentioned about seeds. There's a Texas saying for you, you can put your boots in the oven, but that'll make them biscuits. You can make crosses with your roses, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get anything out of it. And I use this as an illustration because Tom Carruth is the one who told me about this. He said, do not use Betty Boop. You see these stamens that always turn black if you're a rose grower that, you know, as you show roses, you know Betty stamens, Betty Boop's stamens turn black almost immediately. The reason is because it's sterile. You can make all the crosses in the world with this rose and you're not going to get anything out of it. So you need to have not only a rose that's going to set hips, but one that's going to set hips that are going to be productive. And how do you do that? Well, then that's where you start studying the parentage of other roses. That's where you pay attention to what's going on in your garden. I would go out each fall and make notes in my garden as to what roses have in fact set hips. And then I would study on Help Me Find, which I'll describe a little later, to see what had come out of those. And, and that, uh, and also because of being involved with the Rose Hybridizers Association, I could identify mother plants that would set hips and produce something. Then here's the principle. It's the same principle that the horse breeders do. This is a horse that is owned by a client of mine. Uh, this is what I do during the day uh, as I practice tax law. And uh, my client and his son bought this horse many, many years ago. Uh, and they paid an enormous amount of money for it, but went on to become a great uh, racehorse, uh, won the Wood Memorial, which is a grade one handicap race, and is now the leading sire by lifetime black type earnings, its progeny having earned $80 million. This is Tappet. Uh, I've talked to David Clemens about someday having a white horse rose named Tappet. Uh, but here, this is Tappet, and the principle that the horse breeders use is breed the best of the best and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. So when you're selecting parents, you need to select the best. So I'm ready to select some parents. And in my mind, at this time, in fact, to this day, this, this is about the best hybrid tea that had ever been developed. This is Gemini. And I said, okay, I'm going to start with Gemini because I want to develop a show quality rose and what better uh, at the time Gemini was the number one exhibition rose and instead of starting with Gemini however I did something different whoops what in the world have I just done <laughs> there it is I clicked on tap it here's Gemini what I did is I went to Gemini's mother. The reason I went to Gemini's mother is because I had this rose in the garden. The reason I had this rose in the garden because I was involved in naming this rose, which is a story in and of itself. But I knew that this rose set hips and I had it in the garden. And this is Anne Moreau Lindbergh. Anne Moreau Lindbergh is the mother of Gemini. And you can see the very similar family relationship. Here's uh, it as I exhibition form bloom here's is an open bloom and there is the bush in our yard so i have gemini and Merle Lindbergh. at the time i had written an article and i very much liked the rose glowing amber uh, george manner is a good friend of mine uh, particularly at the time he and i were sharing thoughts all along and i said well i'm going to cross glowing amber with Anne moreau Lindbergh." And what I was after here was a show rose, but I was specifically after a miniature rose. Because what happens when you cross roses with a miniature rose is most of the time you will get a miniature rose because the miniature genes tend to be dominant. So you wind up getting a miniature rose. And I was after a miniature rose and surprise, surprise, I didn't get a miniature rose. I got a big rose. I got Pasadena Star. Pasadena Star, which as you can see is a big rose. Uh, that posed the question of how big, you know, is this a hybrid tea or what? Uh, it's bred from a hybrid tea and a miniature, and it's smaller than Anne Moreau Lindbergh and bigger than Glowing Amber. I released it as a floribunda because uh, I also edit Horizon Roses, and I got tired of reading all the years of so all the roses are too small to be a hybrid tea, and I didn't want this rose to be relegated to obscurity for being too small, so I made it a floribunda. 
Let's I'm gonna give you another breeding tip. And we're gonna call this Bob Martin's breeding principle. And this has to do, it's an offshoot of grow the best to the best and hope for the best is if the parent has a fault, it will come through in its offspring. Here is, for example, Elizabeth Taylor. If anybody's ever grown Elizabeth Taylor, you know it has that annoying white color streak. I can tell you that every offspring that Elizabeth Taylor has that annoying white color streak. If a rose has some kind of a fault to it, for some reason, it goes through. And too often in selecting parents, we're looking at the things that we like about the rose as opposed to things we don't like. And for some reason, some perverse nature of uh, roses, uh, the things that we don't like are going to come through. So in selecting parents, you need to select a parent that doesn't have any faults. That's my view. And that's one of the reasons I have been as successful as I have. So let's go back to Admiral Lindbergh. Here we have Admiral Lindbergh and Admiral Lindbergh. Another thing about Admiral Lindbergh is it makes really big, fat hips. Uh, and it's really easy to make hips. It's just, and the hips germinate, and the seeds germinate. The seeds are easy to handle. The seeds of some roses, particularly miniature roses, tend to be very small. And if you're kind of a klutz with your fingers as I am, these, these seeds just, you know, you're I'm trying to clean these seeds and they go shooting across the counter and onto the floor and I can't find them. Uh, but uh, with respect to Admiral Lindbergh, it makes these big fat hips with these big fat seeds inside of them and they're real easy to handle. So I took Admiral Lindbergh and I crossed it with Fairhope, which at that time was the number one miniature rose. I'm after a really top miniature rose. And what did I get? That's buttercream. I got a mini flora and buttercream has gone on to be the best thing that I've ever produced. Uh, Suzanne Horn, my good friend, shows this rose quite successfully and has written about it extensively. And here's some examples buttercream that uh, from you know, on the show bench. She grows the rose a lot better. Than Here's a basket of it that she put together at one point. Wow. Then you got uh, Peter Cottontail. Peter Cottontail's a sister seedling. It might have even been in the same hip. I don't know. I don't keep that close to track where they're from, but they're the same year and it's the same cross. Peter Cottontail is a sister of, uh, it's an example of what I've described where you cross parents and you get different children. So you can see that there's a relationship between them. Uh, Peter Cottontail, when it's very, very good, can be absolutely outstanding, as you can see from that picture. And uh, although he's just never had the, uh, the strength of buttercream as far as being a show rose. Stepping away from Anne Marin Lindbergh at the time, I was growing a rose called Silver Jubilee and I was going Silver Jubilee. I saw Jill Silver Jubilee at the Gardens of the Rose, St. Albans, England, back when uh, the Royal National Rose Society had a garden there. And this rose uh, had glossy foliage and there, everything, everything else in the garden was ridden with black spot, but Silver Jubilee was clean as a whistle. And I said, hmm, I, wanna, I wanna work with Silver Jubilee because what I'm after is to see if I can come up with a rose that is an exhibition rose that is disease resistant. That was the objective there. And so I took this uh, hybrid tea from Bridges, Step In Out, which has excellent form. And you can see, I took those two pink roses. And this is what I got. I got Bolivar. You know, this is the actual mother plant of Bolivar. In fact, what I got is I got 21 seedlings out of that cross, every single one of which was orange. Think about that one. Two pink roses, orange. So what's up with that, I ask. Well, I mentioned before, help me find. Uh, help me find, you're probably familiar with in terms of uh, finding pictures of roses and so on and information about them. What you really need to do is uh, send in the 25 bucks to them and sign up for the advanced features of it because when you use the advanced features of it, you can get the advanced search and you can look at the parentage of roses. And here's Silver Jubilee. And here's the parentage of Silver Jubilee. There's the parent tree. And so Silver Jubilee is all the way over here. Okay, and so it's got a parent, parent, parent. Look at this rose right there. What's that? One, two, three, four generations back, you get Tropicana. And Tropicana, of course, is the first 
true orange rose. And so what happened is four generations later, that orange came through in the breeding. So here's Bolivar. Now Bolivar's got an interesting story to it. And the story here is how you go about naming roses. I keep a list of, you know, names come to my mind from time to time, various things. I'm watching the commercial, I'm driving down the freeway, I see a sign or something. You know, I say, hey, that'd be a good name for a rose. And so I kind of keep a list of potential rose names. And I know a number of hybridizers who do exactly that, where they just keep names. Well, they wait till you get the rose and see what the rose suggests to you. And in this case, the rose suggested to me South American colors. So I look for, oh gosh, I can't tell you how many South American ideas came to my mind. I remember I wanted to call it Copacabana or something like that, but I never could come up with one that hadn't already been taken. And at the time I was a cigar smoker and I used to send my budwood off to friends who test roses you know, one, uh, and I used the cigar boxes for that. And one day uh, I was packaging up a Bolivar to send off to my friend Don Ballin, former president of the American Rose Society, as uh, some Budwood. And I uh, looked at the lid and behold, here is the brand that I was using, which is called Bolivar. And you'll notice this cape here that Bolivar has. And I said, hey, that's cool. What are Bolivar's taken as a name, erased in the house, check modern roses, never been attached to a name, Rose. And that's how Bolivar got named. It got named after a cigar box. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take another generation, you know. Okay, I like Amaro Lindbergh a lot. And I got Bolivar, which, as you'll recall, was bred from Silver Jubilee and stepping out. And so I want to see what I get with this particular cross. And that's where I got Peachy Cheeks. Uh, it is, you can see is very similar to Gemini, and you can see the Admiral Lindbergh. Latest the combination, you know, when I stumble across something that works, I tend to go keep doing it and doing it. Uh, Herb Swim's book, uh, he likes to exhaust the, you know, make thousands of, of uh, seedlings out of a particular cross to see all the possibilities of that cross. And this cross here has been highly successful for me. In fact, uh, the year I first made this cross, I made a bunch of other crosses, nothing. I had nothing from any other cross that were really from oil. And this one, I had something like 20 or 25 seedlings that merited further evaluation. And the cross is Admiral Lindbergh by Julia Child. Cross the best of the best and hope for the best. And this is the best yellow for Abunda, if not the best for Abunda ever. And that is Julia Child. And from that, I got a mini flora single. Bronze metal. Uh, here's bronze metal, the bush, which is really one great bush. And this is probably the best out of the cross uh, because it's a nice, you know, neat sized bush, as you can see, that actually covers itself with blooms. And this is the mother plant, as a matter of fact, of bronze metal. And I got Angel Grace, that's named after a granddaughter of mine. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of a palish white, palish yellow single. Same cross. I got coconut shrimp. <laughs> coconut shrimp is kind of a David Austin style uh, decorative bloom. Uh, low growing plant with fairly large blooms. Kind of an odd plant, but the blooms are really very, very attractive. Uh, wins the decorative class pretty easily. Uh, it reminded me the name came about because I you know I said, gee, this kind of looks like coconut shrimp. And I, you know, I did a Google search in coconut shrimp and just kind of looked at all the pictures that came up and it looked like that. I put this on my Facebook page and I said, you know, I'm thinking of naming this rose coconut shrimp. What do you think? And I got uh, a, a number of people who said, ew, what an awful name. Ew, I wanted to hate that. And uh, there's a number who thought it was really wonderful. But the real key thing is that everybody had an opinion. They liked it one way or the other. And so that's why I decided to go with coconut shrimp. This is Ruth Tiffany. This is a tall growing shrub, same cross. And I named this after uh, my dear friend, Ruth Tiffany, who was the, then the chair of the convention at which I was to be installed as president. And I felt it appropriate that she should have her own rose. And so here is Ruth Tiffany. And this is Escondido Sunset that uh, I mentioned to Jason earlier. And you can see this is a Floribunda, all out of the same cross. 
Then I got a couple of others out of the cross. I'm not terribly sure what to do with. I've never introduced this. It's got a name. It's named after another granddaughter. This is India Marie. One of the reasons I haven't introduced it is I'm not sure what it is. Uh, as you can see, it's in a container here. This is a one that I propagated to put in this large container. Uh, so it's a good container size rose. It's kind of a, if weeks were to introduce it, they'd probably call it a shrublet. Those blooms are pretty good sized blooms. As you can see, they're absolutely beautiful, uh, but it's rather weak on its stems and it just really doesn't have much of a plant under it. So what do I do? What do I do? I don't know. I've never decided what to do on that, but uh, each time I look at those blooms, I say, you know, I've had a lot of people say, oh, I really want this rose. And I got this rose from that same cross which I call Puppy Love. And as you can see, it's a very nice looking plant. And the problem is, is that's about as good as it gets as far as its form is concerned. You know, and as an exhibitor, I look at that and it just kind of blinds my eyes. I say, oh God, what an awful looking rose. Uh, and yet it's a nice behaved plant uh, with excellent foliage uh, and it is fragrant. What about fragrance? You know, I haven't mentioned that previously and you'll read various writers will tell you that uh, breeders have bred out fragrance. And it's just absolutely untrue. What it, the fragrance is another regressive trait of roses. And you can cross two fragrant roses and you wind up more often than not with a rose not fragrant at all. So it's a recessive characteristic and if you get it, you get it. And so uh, hybridizers, you know, you may ask, how is it that David Austin roses are all fragrant? And the answer is because they make 100,000 of them a year and they smell them all. And the ones that smell good are the ones that uh, go into the hopper to be considered for introduction whereas the ones that do not smell good go into the trash bin. So I don't know what to do with puppy love. I got a fragrant rose that's a decent plant that makes kind of unattractive blooms. Then there's a poem. There was a little girl who had a little girl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. Well, here's a girl with curl. That's what I've just called it for over the years. As you can see, it's got a little curl here in this particular picture. And this is what it looks like when it's good. Well, when it's not good, it's all bleached out, it's spotty, it's just really one ugly rose. So what do I do? What do I do? I don't know. I just, uh, I, I, I've had my hand on this one to throw it out any number of times and never have, because when it's good, it's very, very good, which is how it got to be called the girl with the curl. I want to head into one other additional subject here, and that is the subject of DNA. We're going to talk about the Rose Genome. Back in 2018, a multinational team actually compiled the Rose Genome. Uh, and using the compile it, let's see if I get back to where we are, based on Old Blush. This is 1751 China, one of the uh, stud roses from China, the four stud roses, got 36,000. 377 genes. And I, I think it's interesting, you got old blush. And I'm going to talk about Dr. Malcolm Manners is uh, explained to me what he calls transposons, which he calls hopping genes, which are DNA that move around in a different positions within the genome of a cell. And what happens when it moves around to a different position? Well, Here's some hopping genes, you know, this is the way I think about it. I think about it as a conga line. If Carmen Miranda got up here and she moved to a different place on the line, the line would look different. The same thing happens with roses. Roses uh, basically naturally are supposed to produce uh, five petals. See, here's a rose of California, a species rose. I'm going to tell you a little riddle here. On a summer's day in sultry weather, five brethren were born together, two had beards and two had none, and the other had but half of one. Well, see, this is actually a very ancient riddle. That's one version of it. I found one going back to the 14th century. And what they're referring to here are the sepals of a rose. There's five of them. 
an interesting thing about this is that actually the original reference was to the dog rose, but I've discovered looking at every single rose that every rose is like this, as you will see looking at the five sepals. Botanically, those are called beards. So here's one with a beard on both sides, and here's one with a beard on both sides, and here's one with a beard on one side, and here's two that have no beards at all. Next time in your garden, take a look at your roses. They will all be like this. They will have two with beards on both sides of their face, one with beard on one side, and two with no beards at all. Or maybe, here's Peter Cottontail. There's six of them here. Three with full beards, three with no beards. What's going on here? Well, botanically, what happens is the DNA of the rose says, let's make five sepals and then let's make five petals. Well, what happens if it just makes an extra sepal? Well, okay, then you get six instead of five. That happens because of some kind of a mutation or whatever. But what would happen to old blush if all it did was keep making sepals? Have the green rose. Here's old blush. Here's what happens if it does nothing but make sepals. So what happens when you get some other kind of mutation, if the color comes out different, or if a rose that previously climbed doesn't climb, or a rose that previously didn't climb climbs, or some other characteristic of the rose is different, not just the sepals. And here you have what are called rose sports. And this is the other way that new roses come about is that you discover sports that just occur in nature through some kind of genetic as you can see here, this is Sim Salomon, Memphis Music. Those are all sports of each other. It's all the same rows, only they have got a genetic difference between them. And that's how I discovered Alakazam. Alakazam is the mini forest sport of Hocus Pocus that appeared on a Hocus Pocus bush in my yard. But this is what, it is a highly unstable rose. This is a fairly recent picture of Alakazam, the, one of the bushes that I have. As you can see, virtually every bloom on that is different. And if you can get a bloom on it and the bloom will breed true, propagate true, you start it from cuttings or grafting, and if it comes true, then you have an established sport. I noticed one day several years ago, I was growing Randy Scott, the great white exhibition tea rose. And there was a pink one, actually more of a mauveish pink, and that's Donna Martin, which is a sport, a naturally occurring sport. Sometimes Donna Martin does this, produces stripes, and I've never been able to get one that's stable. People send me pictures of it periodically, and I've had to show up in our own garden. I've tried to propagate it, and I've never been able to propagate it successfully, so I get a successful stripe. Here's a bush a tree rose of Chihuly in our garden. This is the tree rose. You notice something odd about it? What's odd about it is you get a bunch of roses up here that are the orange of Chihuly, and you get a bunch of roses going here, which look like that. This is right on the same bush. So what's going on here? Is that a sport? The answer is, yeah, it's very clearly a sport. Well, I've had some people, if you go to help me find, you will see under pictures of Chihuly, both of these. The fact that a rose sports once, Sam McGreedy told me that when he discovered a sport, the first thing he did was try to obtain plant prat and protection for it in New Zealand because he knew that if it did it once, it would do it again and again and again. And that's what happens, is this is a very common sport. I've had some people argue with me and say, that's not a sport, these are both Chihuly. Well, how can they both be the same rose? And I sent it to Tom Carruth and asked him his opinion, he says, no, one's clearly a sport that's missing the orange, this orange suffusion. And that is the rose Jerry Mathers named after the beaver himself. Here's another sport that has recently appeared in our garden. 
I have Hello Gorgeous, the one on the left side, which as you can see is orange, and the one on the right side is a bush plant right next to it is yellow. And so that's going to get introduced and named after a granddaughter. So if you pay attention in your garden, these sports happen. Somebody like Peter Alonzo has released, I don't know, 10, 12 different sports. He's got a bee's knees that he's got like five different sports off the same plant. And so it happens, and it happens fairly regularly. And so you may very well discover a sport in your own garden. And when we're talking about genetic mutations, you know, well, that of course leads us to speculate about the future of creating new roses. Uh, here are some engineered tomatoes, and they've added uh, tomatoes, a gene from a variety of lemon basil, and they make a tomato smell like a rose because of putting uh, new genes into it. Uh, that's kind of interesting. When I read about this, I said, gee, I wonder if they could take that and make a rose smell like a rose, because as I've mentioned, fragrance is a recessive characteristic. And in fact, that's exactly what's going on. Here's this guy in Florida, been using genetics in order to get fragrance into roses. Now, how do they do that? They use this thing called a gene gun, which shoots tissue with golden tongues and particles. Uh, my research indicates that the original version was equipped with a 22 caliber pistol and blank cartridges. Exactly how this guy did that, took a 22 caliber pistol and shot genes into a plant is beyond me, but that in fact is how they go about inserting genes and that's what they've been working on for years to produce, which is the symbol of the Rose Hybridizers Association of Blue Rose. This is a Photoshop rose, of course, because there is no blue rose. There is no blue rose because delphinidium, which is the uh, pigment that produces blue, is not naturally pre presented in a rose. So I spent years, years and years, and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get this gene into roses. Uh, various companies kept going bankrupt, being acquired by other companies. They were finally acquired by Suntory, the Japanese liquor manufacturing firm. And they announced, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago now, behold, the first blue rose. The gene delphinidium, except the problem is, is that it's the same pukey lavender as every other rose. There's 130 roses in existence. They have the word blue in them. And the only thing they have in common is that none of them are in fact blue. And the blue rose isn't blue either. Why isn't it blue? Because it just, even though they got the gene in there, it is one thing to get the gene in there, it's another to get the gene to express. And what it needs in order to express it is, is it needs acid. You know, what's that plant, uh, I wanna say uh, hibiscus, or maybe it's not the, uh, the one that you, know, you buy in the, uh, in the uh, your local uh, forest and it comes as blue and you know and you raise the plant and it's always pink and the reason it's blue is because you got to give it high levels of acid fertilizer hydrangea yeah you discover the same thing with roses is that it needs a high level of acid uh Kizari was telling me one time where they were they were doing the experimenting and they managed to get it to express blue and what they got were blue anthers that was it blue anthers. Uh, it appears from the best research that we've seen so far is the level of acidity necessary to make the blue rose look blue uh, will actually kill the rose. So we're we gonna have a blue rose, probably not. But anyway, uh, let you speculate about the blue rose and the future of the blue rose. Uh, you wanna create a new rose. Here's another way to go about it is to have a really good friend, actually have the uh, widow of a good friend uh, offer to name the rose after you. And here is the rose uh, hybridized by my late dear friend, Frank Benadella, named after me, Bob Martin. And that is the end. <laughs> One second, Bob. Uh, you, you have